learnings and we, um, we disseminate those learnings. And so today's session is one way that we can help disseminate some of the learnings from our project out into the broader industry and academia. So if I can get this uh, slides moving. So I'd also like to echo Constantine comments in terms of acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're all meeting today in different locations around Australia and pay my respects to elders past and present. So a little bit about Stanwell, we're a Queensland government owned corporation. So we're an interesting um, different type of structure, I guess we've got a, we're a corporation under the Corporations Act. So we have a, a, a independent board um, that have fiduciary duties, but we also are a government owned corporation. So we are under the government owned corporations act within Queensland. It's Queensland's probably a bit unique in that sense that it still has um, a large part of the energy sector under government ownership. So we're, we're an energy provider. So we produce and retail energy to the national electricity market and also to large commercial and industrial customers. So we have a retail business, uh, but that retail business doesn't touch, I guess, suppose um, residential or small scale commercial. It's only targeted at larger commercial and industrial customers. So you won't see our name on, on any of your bills. Queensland, like everywhere else in Australia and around the world is undergoing a major energy transformation. So the Queensland government recently released the energy and jobs plan. That's a plan to help trans transform the state's energy sector to reduce carbon emissions and to increase renewable energy. And so the target is to, for Queensland is to achieve 70% renewable energy by 2032 and 80% by 2035. So that's going to involve a significant investment in renewable energy and storage. And um, that, that process is already underway. Queensland has about 20% renewable energy already, uh, but we need to do a lot more before we can get to these targets by 2032 and 2035. So Stanwell, we have a key role to play in this transformation. We see our role in a few different areas. One is in driving that renewable energy growth and investment. So I'll show you a slide in a minute that talks about some of the work we're doing on building, um, owning and operating and also contracting large scale renewable energy and storage. We've got an extensive portfolio that's being built around that and we'll need to continue that through over the next 15 years. We're also supporting electricity security affordability so our existing thermal assets will keep operating for as long as the market needs them. The, the energy plan has a, a stage process where the existing power station sites will be transformed into green energy hubs over time. Um, so the existing assets will operate differently through that period um, and eventually convert fully into those green energy hubs once the supporting energy storage is ready for the system to move over. So we're very much focused on keeping the lights on at the moment making sure we generate um, as um, affordable and reliable energy as possible. We've also got a third role as well, and that's about creating jobs and economic development in our region. So, so we have two operating sites, two main operating sites. One of those is in the South Burnett, which is Northwest of Brisbane. That's um, the Tarong power stations and also a Meandu mine. And then up in central Queensland near Rockhampton, the Stanwall power station. So those, those existing sites are very important for those communities. And we are committed to creating jobs and economic development in those regions as the energy system changes. So that's how we're working to support the Queensland Energy Plan. Here's a map that shows some of the, the pipeline of projects that we're working on at the moment. So you can see there that it's really concentrated around those two regions that I mentioned in the, the Southern Queensland Renewable Energy Zone, which is an area that's been designated by the Queensland government for renewable energy development. There's three zones in Queensland, Southern, Central and Northern. In the Southern Queensland region, you can see a number of wind farm projects that are under development at the moment. And they'll be brought in through a variety of different methods, including through us in, um, investing into projects, but also through us contracting long-term energy contracts with those developers. You can see some of those have already been announced, like the Tarong West Wind Farm, which I think will be the largest publicly owned wind farm in Australia once it's built at about 500 megawatts. 
the Wombo wind farm, the bluegrass solar farm, and another wind farm that's yet to be announced. So that's in the Southern Res area. And then in the central Queensland Res, we've got a few projects as well. The Clark Creek Wind Farm, which is already under construction. That's a long-term power purchase agreement. We have another wind farm, which is yet to be announced. We have the, the Aldoga Solar Farm, which we'll talk a bit more about in this hydrogen context. And then I guess importantly, um, in terms of those existing power station sites, they're a great location to do energy storage because we've got the connection point, we've got the land at those sites, we've got the skilled workforce. So we're looking to initially do two large scale batteries, the Southern Res and the Central Res batteries, which will be co-located at those existing operating sites, connected into the transmission network and incorporated into our broader portfolio. So that's just really the start. This is the first stage, I guess, of our, of our transformation. And we'll need to probably do about four times as much as this over the next 13 years in order to achieve that, those energy, um, energy plan targets. So lots of work going on and uh, we've got a broader team. My, my role is primarily around hydrogen and there's energy storage projects, but we have a team that's working on the renewable energy projects. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of work happened over several years to, to bring this forward. So onto hydrogen. So we've been involved in hydrogen from a, for a number of years. And I think Constantine mentioned that he'd seen some of the work we did in 2019, 20. We initially looked at a small scale 10 megawatt electrolyzer project, which was planned to be co-located with the Stanwell power station. So we did a piece of work there. We did a feasibility study funded by ARENA looking at that 10 megawatt project. Ultimately, we found that that, was, that project was technically viable but at the time it wasn't commercially viable. And that's because we didn't have the offtake, the, the customer, if you like, to buy that hydrogen. So we were gonna be producing green hydrogen. It would have been fairly expensive hydrogen compared to other forms of hydrogen. And there wasn't the customer demand at that time to really justify that particular project. So that was a 10 megawatt project and it gave us some really good learnings. As we did that process and we looked at the 10 megawatt project, project, we realized that there's a growing demand from a number of countries for importing hydrogen. And there are countries that are certainly have a much stronger requirement for hydrogen than Australia does. And there's a variety of reasons for that. And we'll probably touch on that as well as we talk about hydrogen offtake. But we, we began to pivot our thinking increasingly towards export, because that's where we see the, the biggest opportunity, even in the medium term, not just the long term. So in 2019, we went for a trip over to Japan and Korea, and we met with a lot of the government agencies and companies that are working on hydrogen. And what that made us realize is that that export demand is, is will start to eventuate before 2030. A lot of people have been saying it's going to be 2030s, 2040s, but actually a lot of these companies want to start importing hydrogen before 2030. So we thought we better get cracking and we, worked on a concept study initially. We partnered with Iwatani Corporation, who's one of Japan's um, energy companies. And we did a concept study. Um, and now we've just completed our feasibility study. So this particular slide here is showing an uh, artist impression of the supply chain, the green hydrogen supply chain for our project. So I'll just point out a few features just to orientate you. You can see there in the towards the bottom of the screen, the hydrogen production facilities. This, this area, by the way, is, is um, west of Gladstone. So if you sort of look in the north, in the, the top right-hand corner of the slide, that's where the Gladstone city is. This area is called Aldoga, and it's part of this Gladstone state development area. So this land is all owned by the Queensland government, and it's all zoned for heavy industrial development. So this hydrogen production facility will be based on electrolysis technology. So it'll be using, um, I don't have to tell you, all you people, because you're hydrogen uh, in a hydrogen center, using electrolysis to produce green hydrogen. And you can see there's two phases of the project. It starts out at um, about 100 tonnes per day of hydrogen production, and then it'll move up to 800 tonnes per day in phase two. <clears throat> So as I said, that Aldoga region there, the land is owned and zoned um, for heavy industrial development. We've got the Aldoga solar farm 
just across the road that's being developed by Asiona and is intended to be up to 350 megawatts. So that ability to actually co-locate the hydrogen production facility with renewable energy is a real strength of the project as well. The project will also have a connection into the grid. So this is a, a key learning for us in this early stage of the industry is that in order to get the best economics, we think that a grid connection is the way to go for this particular project for phase one in particular. So we will be connecting into that Larkham Creek substation, which is managed by PowerLink. You can see there the water and hydrogen gas pipelines running from the production facility through to the hydrogen liquefaction facility at Gladstone Port. So we'll produce gaseous hydrogen and then we'll transport it via pipeline to the port. So the Gladstone Port is um, quite a large multi-commodity port. It is, I guess it has a great history of exporting lots of different commodities to the world. And so hydrogen is the, the latest for them. And it's a, certainly they've got strong plans around expanding the port capacity to enable hydrogen export. That location there at, at Fisherman's Landing is just across the water from the three LNG terminals. So that's a strong evidence there that Gladstone has done this before in the recent past in terms of setting up a new industry. So it's a deep water port, there's land there for expansion. So there's capacity to have the, not just liquefaction, but also ammonia storage and also potentially other carriers like um, MCH. The other features on the slide there, you can see the different industries and opportunities that are happening in the area. So the Fortescue Future Industries Green Energy Manufacturing Project, the GEM project is happening just down the road from our project. So they're looking to produce manufacture electrolyzers locally and as well as potentially other components. So that's a, a great opportunity for the industry locally. We've got the Rio Tinto Yarwin Illumina refinery as well. So that's a potential customer for hydrogen. <clears throat> but of course, Gladstone has a huge number of other industries as well that could potentially use hydrogen in the longer term. I suppose the final thing I'd point out on this slide is the central renewable energy zone. So this project is in that zone and the quality of the, the solar resource is high, but there's also pockets of high quality wind as well in that central renewable energy zone. So it's well positioned from that point of view. So that's the project. In terms of the, the consortium, we are working as part of a broader consortium of partners. And that's one of, our, one of our learnings from this project is that probably no single company has got all the expertise that's needed to make something like this happen. And so we're no exception. We've got expertise in the electricity industry. We've also got fairly recent history of operating gas-fired plant as well. We've got experience in handling very large volumes of water and of course, it's a large process plant but we haven't got experience in um, liquefaction. Or we haven't got experience in large scale hydrogen production. Not that many people do in terms of electrolysis. So bringing together that broader partnership, which can give us both the technical expertise, but also to help share risk and cost as well, because this, this industry and these projects do have a high risk profile. This is new. This is, it requires a, a high risk appetite. So being able to share that across multiple partners, is certainly a big plus of having a strong consortium. So in terms of those other members, you can see on the bottom there, APA Group, who are an Australian gas company, bringing expertise around hydrogen gas, um, or gas generally, and pipelines, but also a growing renewable energy footprint. I think they were actually one of the top 10 largest renewable energy developers in Australia at the moment. So they've got a broad suite of expertise. Then in terms of the Japanese companies, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, who are uh, an OEM an engineering company that is developing the technology around hydrogen liquefaction and shipping. And so I should have said on the previous slide too, we are looking at uh, a number of our partners are looking at the liquefied hydrogen pathway, but we're also looking at um, ammonia as well as a pathway. So th there's a lot of discussion happening at the moment around different hydrogen carriers. And we certainly don't think that the, that it's a case of, of one or the other. We think that there'll be different roles for different carriers. Um, there's potential there in Gladstone to have ammonia production 
green ammonia production. So we're certainly actively working on potential ammonia pathways where we sell our green hydrogen to ammonia producers that can then export it or use it domestically in that form of, of ammonia. So, but um, in terms of our consortium, Kawasaki are very focused on that liquefied hydrogen pathway and have started to do that work. Iwatani, who are Japan's largest hydrogen supplier domestically. So they've got about 20 years experience in actually operating compressed and liquefied hydrogen plants, as well as having a distribution network within Japan. So excellent partner. Marabeni, who are a trading house. So they have experience in investment and in all the commercial side of the business. And then Kanto Electric Power, who are they're the second largest generator in Japan. So they're a big power generator and they are looking to use hydrogen in power generation. So again, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about different pathways and uses for hydrogen. And some people are saying, well, they'll never get used in power generation because it's, it's the wrong pathway. But I think that's quite simplistic because actually places like Japan, they are looking to have a portfolio of different energy options and they're looking to have different fuels and different technologies. And, and one of those is hydrogen. So uh, Japan is definitely doing the best they can to develop renewables, but they're also looking at hydrogen as well as being a portion of their energy mix. So that's, and Kansai Electric is definitely part of that as well. So I think that's for us is really important. Having that off taker or the potential customer inside the consortium is definitely one of the, the advantages, but also the learnings that we've had. So feasibility study outcome. We, as I mentioned, we've just been, we've just finalized our feasibility study, which was wrapped up in the middle of the year. And we had funding from ARENA, as well as funding from each of the companies to complete that work. The, we engaged a number of different advisors for that work. So we had Advisian Wally as our technical advisor. We had Deloitte as our commercial financial advisor. Uh, and then we had Minter Ellison as our legal advisor. So we worked together as a team with those advisors to produce the, the feasibility study. And these were some of the key things that we covered off and that we learned through the study. The first one was um, very important, which is about creating the right level of definition and design definition around the project. So in engineering speak, it's a class four cost estimate and design. So that's a plus 30 minus 15%. So that's a, uh, that gives you an, an idea of what that ranges in terms of the uh, the level of accuracy. So that's important because it helps to, you make a number of selections in that process. You have to define what you're gonna, what technologies you're gonna select to a large extent. You have to define um, the amount that you, you know, the, the different balances involved and um, you have to make certain decisions. And so that that process actually reduces risk because it means you've actually defined a number of elements. And I guess the balancing act is making sure that you don't, if there are still options that you want to carry through, that you don't close down those opportunities. So it's always a balancing act between defining and making decisions versus also leaving items open if you think that there's further optionality that you want to carry through into the next phase. So one of the other things we've spent a lot of time on was on the energy support. Apply. And we've got a slide about this later talking about the renewable energy, how important that is in the economics of hydrogen and how we've tried to come up with a, an energy supply solution that gives us that 100% renewable energy supply while also optimizing the value of the, the flexible electrolyzer load. On the technical side, these are some of the elements that we worked on. And there's a, again, a slide later where I'll give some more specific examples around how we've actually optimized and defined the technical solution. It's not my area of expertise. So if, you, if you're an engineer and you want to ask me a detailed engineering question later, then I can take that on notice. Um, but I'll try and give you the best I can on that. The, um, another part of the, the, the feasibility study was identifying the regulatory approvals pathway. So understanding what different approvals we need. There's a interesting, some parts of hydrogen don't have a defined regulatory framework around them. So there's an element of, I suppose, of risk there for the project and of further definition and work that needs to happen with the relevant regulators. But uh, for the most part, this project, because it's in the Gladstone State Development Area in that government owned land with the state planning regime, it has a lower regulatory risk than if you try to do a project across multiple different boundaries. 
We also worked as part of the study on securing and firming up government support and, and the support of our consortium partners. And so we feel we've got a very high level of commitment from our consortium partners to move forward with the project, but also lining up the, the support from the Queensland, Japanese and Australian governments as well. And there's a number of different markers that, are, that we've had there to, to, to indicate that support, um, including receiving $15 million from the Queensland government for our feed study, um, getting the arena support for our feasibility study as well, um, and that we've had Japanese government support for our feasibility. So really it's about trying to carry that support through into the next phase. Also done quite a bit of work around social and stakeholder impact as well, and understanding what does the community need in order for this industry to, to get up and running and to be a success? Uh, what, what are the aspirations and the concerns of the community and how can we try and address those? So we'll I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then finally, understanding what does the next phase look like and trying to develop a detailed plan around the feed, which is the front end engineering design. That's the, the stage where you typically take a project from a class four down to perhaps a class two, a two or three, which really enables you to have those um, bids from, from suppliers or um, contractors, which enables you to make a, a final investment decision. So the next phase of the project is super important and you have to do that planning work before you start. So we've been working on that as well. Okay, so a little bit about economics and what we found around economics of hydrogen. So if we think about the cost of generating or producing one kilogram of hydrogen, you can see there's only really two, two factors that really matter. Um, the first is the capital cost. And the second is the energy cost. And again, I'm sure that working in this area, you're, you're very familiar with this. And depending on when you're doing your hydrogen project and what those relative costs are, you might see that those are about maybe almost 50% each. Or if you, over time, when we see um, the capital cost of electrolyzers come down, we're going to see that the electricity costs start to make up a larger portion. So people talk about 70 or 80%. And certainly as our project progresses through into phase two, we'll see those electricity costs taking up a larger and larger portion of the picture. But this is more around phase one and I guess the base case. So I guess that gives you a good understanding of where do we need to target from a project perspective to try and get the cheapest hydrogen we can. It's very much in those areas. It's in the, the capital cost and also in the energy costs. But I guess the, the underneath that, there's a lot of different factors involved. The, the capital cost, for example, is influenced by the, the whole of life capital, but also the, the efficiency as well. So as, as the technology improves, we're looking for an improvement in the efficiency of the electrolyzer technology, because that will drive improve, that will drive a reduction in both in the capital cost and also in the energy cost as well. So they're the types of areas that we're looking to see over time. So in terms of energy costs, that's probably an area that Stanwell is very focused on. We, you can see here's a, a visual representation of our energy supply strategy for phase one. And this is for the hydrogen production facility. So one of the, the, the benefits of hydrogen electrolyzers is that they are quite a flexible load. They can ramp up and down quite quickly. They're not quite as responsive as a, as a battery, as a lithium ion battery, but they're, they're fairly responsive, which gives you some benefits because if your load can be flexible, then it's going to be um, it's going to reduce the requirements for the firming of the energy supply, and you can accept a, a more variable energy supply. And when we're talking about supplying the project from wind and solar, that's quite important because, of course, those are renewable energy resources that are variable. And so, it's a really good match between the flexible electrolyzer and the variable energy supply. So, this shows you here the the green. Um, the green portion, which is a wind farm generation profile. So it's a 24 hour period we're looking at here, average 24 hour period and the number of megawatts that are being sent out. And you can see that the wind farm, this is a, a central Queensland wind farm is generating more in the morning and evening, which is a nice complement to the solar profile, which is the, the orange portion in the middle that's generating more in the middle of the day. And then you've got the blue, the dark blue line, which is the hydrogen electrolyzer load. So the general idea is to, um, um, sorry, and the other factor as well is the, is the grid energy price, which is the yellow 
dotted line. And you can see that typically peaks in the evening, but also in the morning and, and goes down, is lower in the middle of the day when the solar is generating more strongly. So as a, as a consumer of energy, you've got a decision to make about whether you're going to generate or use the um, electrolyzer or you're going to reduce the electrolyzer load and avoid those energy prices that occur in the evening. Also, the wind farm generation in the evening is stronger. And so you can use the wind farm generation to supply into the market rather than using it for the electrolyzer, which gives you a better, a better financial outcome as well. So this is just a representation of that. You can see that the project does draw from the grid at certain times as well, but the net, the net amount of grid energy is about 5% in this, in this scenario and is fully covered through large scale generation certificates. So that's a, the, the mechanism that's used to track each megawatt hour of electricity, make sure it's coming from renewable energy sources is that you supply a, a large scale generation certificate. So gives you a sense of that energy supply strategy. On the right hand side, you can see there that the, we're progressing a number of different arrangements with different renewable providers to secure that energy. So Aldoga Solar Farm being across the road and then a couple of wind farms as well. I'm talking a lot here, so you, you, you'll get a chance to ask some questions soon, hopefully, but um, just to talk a little bit about hydrogen offtake, and I mentioned that we're progressing both liquefied hydrogen and ammonia offtake opportunities. Uh, Kansai Electric Power Company has, uh, has identified the project as a symbolic project for both Australia and Japan, so they are very much um, committed to progressing it. Um, there's a few facts there about Kansai Electric. They're the second largest generator in Japan with about 30 gigawatts of generation capacity. So that's about 10 times bigger than Stanwell. Um, and to give you the idea, Stanwell is, is the largest generator in Queensland, but um, Cancel Electric is 10 times bigger than us. So they're a very big player and they have they own quite a lot of gas-fired power that is uses LNG as a fuel. And so what they're planning to do is progressively blend hydrogen into that gas-fired generation. And that'll start with uh, 100,000 tonnes of green hydrogen in 2030 that they're planning to import. They've got plans to construct a receiving terminal in Himeji, which is shown on the map. And they're working with the Japanese government on the funding support for the supply chain. So that'll include all the different aspects of that supply chain. So great partner to have on board and certainly the, the key foundational offtaker for the project. Okay, fairly busy slide here talking about the upstream part of the project. So this is looking at everything from the renewable energy power through to the gas pipeline. So I guess from a feasibility study perspective, I've talked about the work we've done on the renewable energy supply and optimizing that. A couple of the other areas to, to note there, the water supply. So that hydrogen, um, as you know, electrolysis uses water in the production process. One of the interesting points, though, is that when people talk about the amount of water that's required for hydrogen production, they generally refer to the actual electrolyzer um, process itself, and the, the, the nine, nine uh, litres of water per, per kilogram. But that, uh, that doesn't include the cooling water requirements. So typically, a project would, um, if it was using uh, wet cooling, the, uh, the, the, it might um, have a multiple of um, five to 10 on that for, for the cooling requirements. So if you use wet cooling, then the amount of water could become very significant. So one of the things we've done through the feasibility is actually work on um, a dry cooling or adiabatic cooling solution for the project to try and reduce that water demand significantly, which, we've, which we, we believe we will be able to do in the project. And so that's a really important factor, both in terms of cost um, although, as, as I showed before, the water cost is, is minimal for the project, but it's more about water availability. So anywhere, most places in the world, and particularly Australia, we need to be conserving water as much as we can. And so um, using dry cooling is, is one of the solutions that we've really brought through in that feasibility study. Um, another area to, to, to mention there is the pipeline. So the hydrogen gas pipeline that runs from the electrolyzer facility to the port. Um, we've been looking at one of the things we considered in the project was whether it was better to use the pipeline for hydrogen storage or whether it was better to have fixed storage. Initially, we thought that it might be good to have the, use the pipeline for storage, 
um, but through the work with the te technical advisor and with um, APA's expert input as well, we've um, we've realised that it is better to use a fixed storage and not use the pipeline as the as the storage solution so that pipeline won't be um, used for storage per se uh, we'll have fixed storage in place so i think it's about 20 tons of fixed storage for this phase one of the project uh, but we will one thing we will look to do is use the pipeline as a common user facility so we're looking to um, share that pipeline um, with other producers and and users of hydrogen as well just to minimize that overall footprint All right, I'll, a few slides to go. Uh, so the hydrogen production facility site, this is the, the site in Aldoga that you saw at the beginning, um, but this is just from a, I guess, from a, a bird's eye view down. Um, this just points out a few of the characteristics of that site. We've secured that site um, through an option agreement with the Queensland government. Uh, we selected it because of its size and proximity to port, power and pipeline infrastructure. Um, it's not subject to coastal inundation, storm surge or aircraft overhead. So it's good from that perspective. And of course, it's in close proximity to the Aldoga solar farm, as well as the Fortescue Future Industries site as well. So um, if you ever have a chance to go out there, it's a great, great little place to, well, not little, it's a huge plot of land, 235 hectares of land, um, but um, there's virtually no near neighbours at all. And so it's a really good place to be building a, a large scale industrial plant. We, as part of the project, we also looked at the economic impacts. And that's one of, as I mentioned at the start, one of the focus areas for Stanwell. We had Deloitte Access to Economics do some economic modeling. So they call it um, computable general equilibrium modeling, which is a fancy way of saying it's whole of economy. So they don't just look at the, the project in isolation. They actually look at how all the different moving parts of the economy are impacted when you build a large project like this. And so you can see some of the stats that came out of that modeling, some significant additions to the, the reg gross regional product of central Queensland, 11.1 billion, um, a large amount of value coming from the hydrogen exports as well over the life of the project, and then the jobs impact as well. And so that's across all sectors of the economy. It's not just the, the direct jobs of the project. It's looking at the range of other industries that are, um, that are benefited from this, like the construction industry, uh, potentially manufacturing services, et cetera. So we definitely see this as being, um, it won't be the only project in central Queensland, but it'll be an important project in just helping the region to, um, as I said at the start, transform itself into, into the new economy. Uh, social considerations. So we've done quite a bit of work on, on the social impact assessment and understanding what the community wants and what their concerns are. You can see here the top the top four concerns for the community, housing, safety, water and environmental impacts. So a lot of the Gladstone is a very experienced and savvy community when it comes to large scale industry. So, but they've seen the boom and bust cycles come before. And so what they're wanting to see is that project proponents like ourselves do what we can to help manage and smooth out those boom and bust cycles. Um, and part of that is about trying to plan ahead and work with different levels of government to ensure that the services that are needed for those industry expansions are actually planned for so that you don't have chronic shortages of housing, for example, that the health services are ready to go. Um, so that's, that's a really important consideration for Gladstone is that how do we avoid that or try and smooth out that boom and bust cycle? There are some concerns around the safety of hydrogen, and I'm sure that you've seen some of the research that's been done. There's probably a broad, a lot of um, lack of understanding or knowledge in the community around hydrogen, but in Gladstone, there's a lot of ex-engineers that, um, that live in the community. So they definitely have are pretty savvy. Um, and so they're wanting to see and, and be confident that this will be done in a safe manner. And we're certainly confident that there's the knowledge in industry and um, to, to ensure that that happens, but we need to help the community see that is occurring. Water supply, which I touched on before, they're definitely concerned about us using lots large amounts of water for industry and taking away from their, their, their existing water supplies. Um, there's a number of different aspects to that. One is water efficiency and so trying to do those initiatives like, um, uh, like the dry cooling. Another initiative is the potential seawater cooling, potentially for the, um, for the hydrogen liquefaction facility. Um, but also the other factor as well is that 
as the industry changes in that region and you see more uh, less coal-fired generation because that coal-fired generation uses a lot of water as that generation um, reduces you're going to see a lot more water freed up for new industries like hydrogen so that's part of the picture here is about the changing industrial mix in that region and the fact there will be a lot more water available um, we got a, our power station in um, in Rockhampton, near Rockhampton uses up to 20 gigalitres of water per year and um, and the hydrogen plant will use a fraction of that so they, you know, they, we can sort of demonstrate for the community that this is this is going to be part of that transition and that um, we're doing everything we can to minimize the use of water but also that we're looking at sustainable water options as well so desalination is definitely on the agenda probably not for phase one of our project but i think by the time i get to phase two that will be in the, in the equation on the right i won't go through all the things on the right but they're the they're the aspirations and the things that the community wants to see from this industry as well which is very important finally um well, i think it's the second last slide so we're working with a broader group of companies in gladstone around a hydrogen hub um fair to say a hub is probably one of those buzzwords that's being used a lot and and the basic idea is it's about co-locating and coordinating hydrogen supply and demand to try and achieve um, better better economic outcomes better better commercial outcomes um, but also better social outcomes as well so it's part of that collaboration is trying on things like common user infrastructure to try and avoid the duplication that we've seen with other industries being developed but also trying to get some of the domestic uses of hydrogen going and so you can see a number of different projects that are occurring in the region to use hydrogen in domestic applications as well as the export projects so we're working together through an alliance we're what we're calling a, a central queensland hydrogen alliance uh, we've recently or back in april we we received um, 70 million dollars or 69.2 million dollars from the australian government to develop the hub and that's recently been confirmed through the budget process so uh, working on that but i think the important point here is this is not just about you know one or two big projects it's actually about developing a working together to develop a whole hub and an ecosystem around this um, because i think yeah there's a lot of features of hydrogen that that make it quite challenging and i think uh you know the extent we can actually try and co-locate and improve efficiencies is going to be really important to get this off the ground so project schedule where are we going from here we've done our feasibility study as i mentioned we're aiming to start our feed in early 2023. Um, that'll take us through to a final investment decision in the middle of 2024, and then it'll be into execution. So um, with commercial operations in early 2027. So yeah, makes it sound simple, um, but that's that's the plan. So I'll probably stop there now, and I think we've got a little bit of time for some questions. Yep, perfect. Phil, thank you so much um, for that great presentation. Um, so eye-opening. and. It, it's really good to see some serious commitment and, and genuine enthusiasm about scale up of hydrogen in Australia. And I think um, as researchers in the training center, it, it's really motivating to sort of see how some of our research goes to directly addressing a lot of the challenges that, that you brought up today. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Um, and again, I remind the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, the first question we've got from Rose. Um, Rose asks, how expensive is the hydrogen produced from the 10 megawatt electrolyzer that you mentioned that was technically viable but not commercially viable yet? Yeah, so I think the, uh, it was a little time, a little while ago now, but I think from, from recollection, the, the basic cost of hydrogen production was probably around $6 per kilogram. Um, it, it may have been slightly higher than that, but I think part of the challenge was that then we had to transport the hydrogen to the user. And so that was going to add probably $2, 2 to $3 per kilogram. So it was going to end up being a 8 to $9 a kilogram hydrogen cost. Now, I don't think that if you were to do that today, um, you could potentially make that work. There's probably some transport applications where that, that type of price of hydrogen might work. Um, and so we certainly haven't abandoned those plans around smaller scale domestic hydrogen. I've focused a lot on the export side today, but we are we have got a, um, a team that's working on domestic hydrogen opportunities. And, and we are still looking at using that Stanwell power station site to potentially host some smaller scale electrolyzers and, and loading facilities for for trucking. So anyway, that's the, um, the, the basic answer. Okay, great. Thank you, Phil. 
Um, and and Junjie asks a really interesting follow-up question to that. Um, and how does that sort of cost estimation compare with the 2035 production um, with the three gigawatt electrolyzer? And is there any scope to use that hydrogen um, to New South Wales ports as well to transport it there to use that as a um, sort of offtake point? Mm. <clears throat> that's that's a big question isn't it is what, what's it going to cost to produce hydrogen in 2035 <laughs> um we, we've we've run a few different cases on that and i guess um you know that the, the base case is that it probably um it would probably still cost you more than three dollars a kilo um in, in early 2030s to produce hydrogen i think um, there's been a lot of talk about getting to h2 under two and getting there very quickly but we don't necess necessarily see that happening in that time frame um, uh, part of that is just um, some of the impacts we've seen more recently, and these, they, we expect these will flow through eventually. But there certainly has been a pause on cost reductions in um, in construction, a pause on cost reductions in renewable energy. Uh, the cost of renewables has probably gone up by twenty to thirty percent in the last twelve to eighteen months. So it's going to take time for that to to flow through the system. And of course, at the same time, the demand for renewable energy with things like the Queensland Jobs Plan or Energy and Jobs Plan has gone through the roof. So, yeah, I think one of the things we we always try and keep in mind is whether the cost is two, three, or four dollars a kilo. Hopefully, it's not four. Um, it's all about the relative pricing. It's not about absolutes. So we could say it needs to be a two, but that that makes a whole bunch of assumptions about what's happening in other markets um, and how strong um, government incentives are, for example. So I think if we can actually Produce hydrogen for you know two to three dollars a kilo by 2035. I, I think it will. I think it will still have a place. I think it will still have a role. Um, can it be taken to New South Wales? Absolutely. But I think maybe some New South Wales uh, project proponents might have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. They might might be wanting to um, to produce their own hydrogen. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Phil. And it, it's a really interesting take because we're, we're often thrown um, this absolute number of $2 per kilogram kind of thing. But yeah, you're right. There's so many other external factors that that play into that as well. Um, and we've got a lot of questions that are quite interested in um, sort of the techno-economics. And, and I think Michael's asked a pretty interesting one that sort of consolidates that there. Um, we talked a little bit about the cost of green hydrogen production from smaller plants and, and sort of how that sort of reduces with the larger plant. Um, but, but what are the key factors that allows you to sort of um, produce cheaper hydrogen with the larger plant? Is it the economies of scale or, for example, is it that we can now um, reach other off takers who, who are interested in the larger quantities, for example? Mm. Yeah, it's definitely I think the economics are imp improved both on the the production cost and also then on the, the market side. So on the production cost, it, it uh, I don't think it's drastically lower than, than at 10 megawatts. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking it's, it's say six to $7 for 10 megawatts, it's probably in that, um, you know, five, five to $6 range for the, for the large scale project in the initial stages. And, and when I say the initial stages, that's because we're basically building the first, probably one of the first two to 300 megawatt electrolyzers out there and so it's not going to be while the electrolyzer technology is modular it's not as though the whole process is modularized or is is optimized you're having to do it for the first time or one of the first times so the benefits you do get are that that balance of plant is lower because you um, you get economies of scale on on the balance of plant components like compression storage etc which aren't quite as modular um, you also get some benefits in terms of using the the electrolyzer as a, as a flexible load, because if you've got a, a two or 300 megawatt electrolyzer, it can actually give you some serious benefits as a, as a flexible demand response mechanism. Whereas at 10 megawatts, you're probably not really able to use that as a in that way within your broader portfolio. So I think that on the cost side, they're probably the main things. On the, the market side, it's definitely, yeah, that opening up that export market and that probably, um, yeah, a lot of the domestic applications for hydrogen are either not very big at the moment, um, or are, are very, or the pricing is too sharp to really make it work. So, for example, using um, trying to produce hydrogen for, say, ammonia production domestically at the moment, if unless customers are willing to pay more for a green premium, you're, you're very challenged to compete against natural gas. Um, although natural gas is pretty expensive now, but a normal natural gas price is very challenging to compete with. But if you're exporting to a country that basically has a, a portfolio view and they're trying to develop hydrogen as a pathway, then they're going to have a, 
a higher appetite for for paying a premium because they see it as a as a portfolio and as a risk mitigant and it's not you know it's just not about having a single solution that's the cheapest it's actually about having a portfolio so that if something goes wrong with a supplier like a sovereign issue or, or whatever it is a market issue they've got different options up their sleeve and we've seen that that issue in Europe with the the Russian gas you know what happens when you're over reliant on a single source that might be cheap but maybe it's got geopolitical issues or things like that yeah no that that makes complete sense thank you for that bill um and just as a follow-up to that um when looking at sort of the diversity of offerings that we can give to the market has there been any interest in green methanol in addition to green ammonia yeah there, there is some interest there's a there is actually a proponent um in gladstone that's looking at, at green methanol so um that's definitely there's definitely some, some interest and some activity there. And so they are a potential off-taker for our hydrogen. And I know that through the um, H2 Global scheme that the German government is running, that they the two the two carriers that are looking at are methanol and uh, ammonia. So they're definitely focused on that. So yeah, I can see methanol and ammonia as, as good pathways in that they're relatively well-established um, methods of, of transporting hydrogen. Okay, great. That sounds good. Um, Mandalena asks, um, as a training center, we are keen to partner with industry and prepare industry ready graduates to support the transition to the hydrogen economy. Um, are you able to comment on the skill gaps and what's required for education and the training sector to support the industry in this way? Yeah, it's um, certainly an area, area of focus for us and, um, and I think a number of different governments are, are working on this as well as different educational institutions. Our initial view is that, um, and it's probably not an area that I'm a real expert in, but our initial view is that it's probably about the bridging of, of existing skill sets. So, um, for example, on our hydrogen production facility, when it comes to managing the water supply or managing the electrical component of that of that plant, our existing workforce has got a lot of the, the relevant skills, but they need some bridging courses. Um, to understand some of the key hydrogen competencies around hydrogen safety, what is hydrogen, you know, how is it, how is it handled, how is it used, as well as some of the broader um, issues around hydrogen as a more of a bridging qualification or skill to take them from you know, being an electrical engineer, for example, in the in a coal-fired power station to being an electrical engineer in a in a hydrogen production facility. So no doubt there will be some specialized courses that get, and I'm sure that people will start to badge courses as hydrogen degrees or courses but we we see that for our workforce most of them can transition over with some bridging competencies rather than having to go and study a, a bachelor's or a master's in a, in a new field but having said that i'm sure that there'll be some some very uh some good marketing opportunities for you know universities that want to market for green hydrogen qualifications or or to have maybe i think one great idea is having a green hydrogen or a hydrogen um, stream within a within a degree or a program like a like a master's in energy, for example. So anyway, that's not a, uh, that hasn't given you a detailed mapping of the skills. We we have got some of that initial work done as well around what are the specific competencies that need to be done through those bridging programs. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, it, it does answer the question very well, I think. Um, and I think just as a follow up question, um, you know, with the sort of ARC training center that we have here, um, I guess we are trying to bridge that gap, particularly in the sort of research field and making sure that the research really sort of aligns with the challenges that you're facing. Um, so I guess if we sort of look at the technology side as a whole, right from, you know, constructing the plant and, and sort of procuring the equipment to operating the plant and, and right to off-taking the hydrogen. Um, is there sort of one area that you see might be a bottleneck to this project overall? And, and again, I asked sort of in the context of, you know, as researchers, we really want to try and understand the challenges that you face as an industry and how we can really train or, or tune our research to address those problems. And I think that's one of the key goals of the training center that we have here. Mm. I think um, if we think about the parts of the process that are, are new or that can be improved, um, part of it will come from that uh, sort of touch before on that idea of the modularization. So not just about the electrolyzer modules, because clearly those will become bigger and the manufacturing of those will become more efficient and that's going to drive a lot of improvement. But then it's also the modularization of the overall production facility. So when we think about our 100 ton a day plant, 
that'll probably be done through, I think it's called like a stick build where you, you bring in and you almost build it up from, from scratch. Whereas I think by the time we start to get towards 800 tons a day, we'll be wanting to bring in a modularized solution that maybe incorporates more of the balance of plant and to be able to have more of that um, constructed or assembled offsite and then brought in as a module and put it on site. So we see a lot of efficiencies through that modularization process. Um, but also I think going back to the electrolyzer technology and it's kind of the holy grail at the moment is how do we try and lift those efficiencies within the limits of thermodynamics, but how do we try and improve the efficiency of electrolyzers? But also how do we, probably a risk for us and for any project is the supply of electrolyzers because, mm. um, you know, the, the Europeans are wanting to do heaps of hydrogen over the next 10 years. The US government's got new incentives on, on, on the table for hydrogen as well. So we're going to be competing for supply of electrolyzers. So, you know, can Australia step up and start to play a role in, in manufacturing or in, um, in producing hydrogen um, engineering or technology? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really interesting and it's really affirming to hear because a lot of our research revolves around increasing the efficiency. We're also thinking about making the stacks sort of smaller but more potent and, and so that ties in with the kind of modularization. Um, and of course, if we can sort of manufacture and, and put together our Australian electrolyzers, which ties into some of the um, spin-offs and, and implementations that we're also focusing on, that, that's also a plus side. So it's really affirming to hear that. Mm, excellent. And we've just got one last question, um, again, tied into sort of, I, I guess, um, different sort of schemes in which we can um, produce the hydrogen as efficiently as possible. Um, Moj Taba asks, um, have you studied the feasibility of hydrogen production from waste gasification plants? No, we haven't studied that um, particularly. And I think potentially part, part of the reason is probably to do with scale. Um, I think it's, um, I think for small scale applications and certainly with um, with electricity generation, those uh, waste waste gas um, applications have, have been very successful for electricity generation. But I suppose the issue is you need to co-locate it at the site of the waste. Generally, you don't want to be transporting the, the waste to that location. And there's probably some constraints around scale as well. So for example, that tend to be, they might be co-located with the, with a municipal waste facility. And so then there's a, a bit of a scale restriction on how big you can make the, whether it's the generator or the the, the hydrogen production. So um, I think there's been some discussion around using tyres as well, like old tyres. Um, there's pro there's a proponent, I think, in central Queensland that wants to use tyres, um, old tyres to produce hydrogen. So yeah, there's definitely talk and discussion happening around it. And I guess the issue for us is it's we don't see it as something that we can replicate and scale. And that's and that's often the challenge with anything with biofuels or, or, or anything waste or anything like that is scalability is tough and, and fuel supply, if you like, is tough. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. 